Welcome back to Hueytown. And yes, folks, it actually does rain in Hueytown, Alabama. Now let's get down to business. Now you talk about a racing pioneer. Herschel McGriff ran his first race out in Portland, Oregon, just a few weeks after the end of World War II. Though people call him the Richard Petty of the West, his first big break came down south, way down south. It was the 1950 Carrera Pan American Road Race. In the beginning, young Herschel was a natural behind the wheel, but he had a lot of things to learn about preparation. We got down there a couple days before the race, and I thought, well, I'll, the, the first leg was only 230 miles. So I thought, well, I'll go run this course and see what it's like. Well, I got out of town. It was kind of flat and not many turns, and I got uh, eight or ten miles. I thought, well, there's no use to do this. I turned around and came back. Uh, so we didn't go down there, you know, with a lot of uh, preparation, but it was a new car, and, uh, and we really didn't have to do anything to it other than we put the extra fuel tank in the back, which was allowed. We could take the back seat out, put safety belts in it, but you know, the doors weren't tied, there was no roll bars or anything. We did wear a helmet. Of course, with them days, we didn't have uniforms yet. Whatever Herschel may have lacked in experience and equipment, he more than made up for in confidence. You know, we had the guys from Italy over there that were famous and, you know, had a lot of racing experience. Uh, Johnny Mance, you know, of course, was down there with the Lincoln. They'd been, they'd been running the course. And so there was a lot of competition. But, you know, I looked at them... Uh, just as I look at you, and he had two arms and two legs, and so did I, and I was physically in good shape. And I always thought that I had as good a chance as they did, even though they had a little more experience. As he and his partner, Ray Elliott, got near the end of the 2,000 mile race, they began to wish maybe they had checked out the course a little more carefully. The race was supposed to celebrate the completion of the Pan American Highway, but the celebration was a little premature. Pretty soon the boys found themselves tearing across an uncharted dirt path covered with rocks, craters, and rattlesnakes. The ironic thing about it was a mile or two before the finish line, I did not know where the finish line was. I knew I had to really drive fast. I was eight minutes behind starting out the last day. So I, I felt if I just ran as fast as I could possibly go and still get the car there in one piece that I could win the race. And of course we we made up the eight minutes plus 76 seconds and that was the margin. I was probably doing 100 mile an hour with the car, all it was doing was bouncing on this rock. And I remember I didn't get it, I didn't get it up on the berm at this one point, it hit the bottom. It felt like it was gonna tear the floorboards right out. But anyway, we kept going pretty quick, there was a finish line. What happened, it actually ripped the bottom of the pan open and the gas tank. So had the race been any further or another mile or two, that would have been it because when, they went to, when I went to move the car for inspection, the lifters and everything was rattled and I shut it off quicker, there was no oil in it. Well, that's what auto racing's all about. And if Herschel McGriff wasn't hooked on the sport before, Mexico changed all that. A week earlier, he was just an unknown kid from the Northwest. Now he was racing's newest hero. The race was a big thing uh, to the Mexican people. I mean, I was a hero. I was recognized on the street everywhere uh, shortly after the race. It was one of the big events, uh, you know, of the century. And, but nobody realized it for several years after I won it. And of course, I was only 22 years old and I just thought that's what you were supposed to do. That's probably Herschel McGriff's secret right there. He figures out what he is supposed to do and he goes out and does it plain and simple. Over the next 40 years, he would be faced with some pretty tough decisions, but would always end up doing the right thing. I'll show you what I mean when we come back. Herschel McGriff has a great perspective on the way auto racing has evolved. When he started driving, Herschel didn't start out in any go-karts or any quarter midgets. He was driving a full-sized, grown-up street car. That's just the way they did things back then. Herschel, you bought your first car when you was 13 years old. What does anybody need a car for when they're 13? Well, it was about a mile to school. And, I, I, you know, I did, wanted to do a little better than the rest of the kids, not ride my bicycle. And I was a worker. You know, I'd worked all summer on the railroad. And... Uh, made a little money in them days. I remember I had $120 cash. That's what I paid for the car. Burning your pocket up. Burning my pocket, and I paid cash for it and drove it to school. 
back then, a 13-year-old kid cruising around a big old streetcar wasn't as strange as it sounds. In South Dakota, uh, at that time, you didn't have to have a driver's license. So I never had any problem with that. In fact, it was several years later, I think, before that came in. And at age 13, I had worked on the Milwaukee Railroad uh, driving motor cars that hauled the men back and forth to work. So, of course, I was, uh, I loved cars and I loved driving, and that's how I kind of got my start. So at 13, I was, I felt like I was no pro to own a car. Herschel's love of cars was what first got him into racing. When he went to the track to run his first race, he really didn't know what to expect. There was an advertisement in the Portland paper and that there was going to be a stock car race, and I don't know what was into me. I just like cars so well. My dad offered to uh, let me use his car. Of course, he didn't really know what was going to go on either. That was a street car. It was a regular street car. It was a 1940 Hudson, probably the most ugliest car that was, <laughs> that was ever built. That car was the only thing that was ugly. The Portland Speedway left a whole lot to be desired. Uh, it was a wild race. That You know, the track got holes in it two or three feet deep and the wheels would come out the rear fenders, and I lost three or four wheels, I remember, during the race. Of course, I'd come in and put them back on again, but I was pretty green, but uh, uh, I caught on pretty quick. It may sound nostalgic to say the sport was simpler then, but that's the honest truth. High-tech auto shops were unheard of. They simply hadn't been invented yet. In those days, cutting-edge technology was stuff like pavement. Most of the tracks that we ran on were dirt at that time, Although, uh, you know, I lived in Portland, that's where the first dirt race is. The second race there, they blacktopped it. So, you know, I got my teeth cut a lot on blacktop right from the start, too. Despite his dedication, Herschel McGriff was not a full-time racer. He was working a full shift for a logging company. As a driver, of course, this provided him with some unconventional training that would ultimately make a big difference on the racetrack. There was no such thing as power steering, and... Uh, them log trucks, when you were uh, driving them around, backing in under the loads and so forth, they really turned hard. Probably one of the biggest things was throwing the chains over the load and so forth. I was really husky, and I was really strong. So I think uh, when I got in the race car at that young age, driving that car three or four or five hours, it didn't. I wasn't ever tired. In 1949 was your first really, really big successful year in racing. What was that like? Well, I had a car owner that really took care of the car. Uh, and basically, uh, I had had, you know, I had a couple of years under my belt by then. And uh, with a little more experience, the only trouble I had, I was so young, uh, I had a little trouble with some of the older guys. Because most of the guys racing then, uh, what I call old guys, I mean, they were at least 40. So, Sounded uh, younger all the time, <laughs> didn't it? <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they finally figured out that I met business. Uh, getting in that race car, and I wanted to win as bad as they did. And I had the determination and the desire to win, and that's what it took. Desire and determination is what pushed him to his triumph in Mexico a few years later. That race did more than launch Herschel's career. It was there he met another pioneer legend of auto racing, Bill France. Their relationship was to last over 40 years. My experience, uh, uh, with the France family goes back a long ways. I, I flew with Bill France Sr. in his airplane. This was in 1954. Uh, when I was back there running full time for a short period, uh, he would pick me up in his airplane and the thing that was going on then, you know, was the plans of, uh, you know, for Daytona. So, you know, I seen a lot of history way back before it ever happened. Herschel, he did the whole, uh the whole series back there for a couple of years and he was a uh, he's a great driver he was driving winning races running up front uh, when Richard Petty was still in high school but he's, a, he's a great competitor and, and he's a class guy and he's a absolutely a, a gentleman and a, and a class act a bit of history that Herschel was a part of was the first Southern 500 I didn't know how big it was going to be, and it was the start of a, you know, of a real revolution as far as, as uh, racing goes, uh, being the first super speedway. Now, I had been running on uh, you know, half-mile tracks, uh, mild dirt tracks uh, on, on the Pacific Coast, and uh, so it was a new experience. A new experience that would last through the next four decades. At the 1991 Winston Cup Awards Banquet in New York City, 
Herschel was given the NASCAR Award of Excellence, an award that finally recognized the enormous achievements of all those coast-to-coast -coast racing trips. That sort of life can take its toll on a man, especially a family man with five children at home. So after nine years on the leading edge of his profession, Herschel McGriff would have to face the hardest decision of his career. How could he continue to race all over the country and still be the kind of father he knew his family needed him to be? In 1955, Herschel McGriff was racing at the top of his game. He was doing so well that he was offered a ride with a new Chrysler team, a ride that would have made him the dominant force in the world of NASCAR. Trouble was, NASCAR was rooted in the South, and Herschel's family had just moved back up to Oregon. Rather than uproot them all again, he turned down the ride and became a full-time father. That was the last anyone heard from Herschel for a long time. Dad just felt that he needed to get um, established. You know, he needed a business, he needed to be with his family, and doing it the way he was doing it on the East Coast. You know, my mom was at home with the kids, and he was gone so much of the time that he decided he needed to get established and build a business first and think about racing later. It wasn't a real easy choice to make at the time because I liked to race, and I knew it was a good opportunity because Bill had given me the opportunity to, to, to race for Frank Christian you know, the year before, and I knew the Chrysler thing was, was, was going to be something. But, you know, there's certain things that you have feelings for, and I just felt I should stay home. And I've never really regretted it. But then, on the other hand, you look back, you think, well, maybe by this time I might have won more races than Richard Petty, because I had a 10-year head start on him. Of course, these days, spending time with the McGriff family isn't exactly a vacation from the racetrack. At one time, I had four relatives in the same race. My brother, my dad, my father-in-law, and my husband. My sister was involved through uh, my dad running her husband's car one time, and, and they met. My brother raced alongside of my dad, and my little brother started racing. And uh, my sister, Gina, she works for one of my dad's sponsors. So we've all been involved in racing in some way and, and been successful at it. Can you imagine what the conversation is like with these folks getting together for the holidays? To me, Herschel McGriff is a true winner. Racing is in his blood and he just can't walk away from it. Sure enough, in 1967, 22 years after his first race, Herschel got a call that put him back on the racing circuit. I had an invitation to drive a car in 67, 68, belonged to uh, uh, a Pollock Motors up in, in Portland. And it had an experienced driver, Bill Emick, driving it, and he got another ride. And so, uh, you know, I was single at the time and had a few dollars, and I got in there, and, uh, and I really liked the feel of it. I drove it a few races up north. So I built me a uh, sportsman car that I brought down to Riverside in 1969. And uh, that was the days when we had the Permatex races, and I won that first race. And, of course, that lit me off and uh, been going at it steady ever since. The man who had left the sport to stay at home happily found he was still very much at home behind the wheel. Really, after being out that long, I re really didn't feel that different. I, I felt like I just maybe got out the week before. I feel a lot more confident uh, sometimes now than I feel uh, and competitive as I was, you know, way back when I first started. Old Herschel has plenty to be confident about. Since his return, he has dominated the Winston West Series. In 1972, he won a record 12 races. He's taken the most popular driver award every year for a decade. Herschel McGriff is more than the proud sentimental favorite. He's finished in the top five every year since 1984. And in 86, he won the whole series, becoming NASCAR's oldest Winston champion. I'm very serious about my racing, and uh, it's just that you got to keep your act together, have good equipment, uh, good teamwork. There's so much more to it these days than there used to be in the olden days when you just got and kind of got in your streetcar and you know went to the race and then drove it back. You just mentioned if you have good equipment. How do you see these cars? How have they changed through the years of race cars? Now we got ultimate race cars now. What do you see the difference now? Well, if you took and lined up a 1940 Hudson uh, against you know a, a new Pontiac I drive, is just a world of difference and. Uh, uh, 
of course, no comparison in looks. It's amazing that we got them cars around as well as we did in them days. Actually, the new cars are much easier to drive, except, you know, you got the such higher speeds and, of course, the super speedway uh, now to run on with, with all the drafting and everything. It's just a different ball game. So, you know, it changes with time. And, and so the only thing you have to do as a driver is change with the times, and that's what I've tried to do. Herschel has gotten used to running against younger guys. Of course, they're all younger than him these days. But how do the other racers deal with a man two or three times their age? Now, I remember the first time we were at uh, the Winston Washington 500 up there, the first 500 lap race out here. And uh, we were talking about, you know, if the old man could go the distance, you know, and uh, who was there? My, I won the thing, but who was on my tail uh, and, you know, trying to get me at the end was Herschel. And, uh, you know, I got a lot of, enormous amount of respect for him, and he's a great individual. Well, I'll tell you what, Herschel's one tough customer. They may say he's getting older, but it doesn't show in a race car. I enjoy all the drivers of company. You know, at this point, uh, the young drivers look at me. A lot of them come up for advice. But see, they look at me now in a, in, in a different in a different light. They think that guy's too old and he can't beat me. He's not supposed to do that. Not that they show me any respect, particularly on the racetrack, but they show me a lot of respect off the track. Well. Any driver that doesn't start off respecting Herschel McGriff when they're taking the green flag has changed his mind by the time the checkered flag comes down. Folks, Herschel McGriff is amazing. He's had a great racing career. And you'd think he'd be slowing down a little bit, but he's not. This is a Southwest Tour car, and there's something else down there I want to show you. Come on. And here he is with his Winston Cup car. I, uh, you know, I like doing what I'm doing, and so, uh, and I still feel competitive. Like, you know, when the time comes that I can't keep up with the boys, and there's a lot of young fast ones coming up, as you know, uh, I guess maybe I'd move over. Does that incentive, is that incentive to win still there just as strong as ever? It really is, and um, I guess if I, if I lost that incentive, uh, well, then I'd, I'd, I'd want to do something else. And, uh, you know, I figure I have to keep racing, otherwise Gant might quit. <laughs> and, and I think it's great that he's doing what he's doing at his age, and, and it goes to show you that uh, if you got the will to get in there and you got the equipment, you, you can still win. Uh, I like racing, and I like my work, and I'm enjoying my family, and uh, so what else is there? Now, that's my idea of a real winner. It may have taken 50 years, but he seems to have found the perfect balance between racing and family. It's hard to imagine what this sport would be like with no Herschel McGriff. And for darn sure, there aren't too many of us who can remember it without Herschel. A lot of drivers out there grew up with auto racing, but auto racing grew up with Herschel McGriff. And I hope they both keep on growing. See you next time on Winners from Hueytown, Alabama, home of the Gopher Dome and other scenic spots. Winners has been brought to you by Autolite Spark Plugs and Wire and Cable Products. Autolite Spark Plugs, guaranteed for two years no matter how far you go. And Fram Filter Products. Fram, you can pay a little now or a lot later. Next week on Winners, Cal Petty tells us about the impact his father had on his racing career and the dedication it takes to be a winner. Promotional consideration furnished by Bonine. Get details in your reservation form for the exciting new Winner's Collectible Truck Series. Send your name and address to truck, P.O. Box 93220, Atlanta, Georgia, 30377. Reserve now.